इतना बेटर लगे कि परसेंट है ना उनको सुबह दे व्हाट्सएप पे बोलना तो पड़ेगा गुड मॉर्निंग सर सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू गुड मॉर्निंग प्रोफेसर सिद्धार्थ सोनी साहब गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड एंड फ्रेंड्स फ्रॉम इंदौर एंड आई सी सम ऑफ माय कोलीग्स एंड फ्रेंड्स एंड सीनियर्स फ्रॉम अहमदाबाद आल्सो गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर अजय सर वर यू सर गुड मॉर्निंग 
Shall we wait for some more time or what time we are planning to start? But I think we have to wait for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So within two minutes, we are starting. Okay. okay. No problem. Please let me know whenever we are starting. I'll... बहुत बढ़िया पेंटिंग लगा लिया आपने सक्सेन साहब पीछे बहुत कहा का लगा दीवार में पेंटिंग लगी हुई बहुत सुंदर है पेंटिंग थैंक यू सर सुनिए नमस्कार अच्छा मास्क लगाया हुआ है मास्क मास्क लगाया आपने घर के अंदर मास्क की जरूरत नहीं सर Okay, thank you, sir. On on this occasion of birth anniversary of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, father of Indian Space Program, the day which we celebrate as a National Remote Sensing Day, I, Rajesh Khatri, Secretary, ISRA Sindhur Chapter, SGS ITS, welcome welcome today, guest and speaker, Dr. Prakash Chauhan. director iirs dehradun i also welcome dr rk saxena the director sgs its indore i welcome all the dignitaries from the various institutes organizations all the faculty members and participants iirs indore chapter was established almost 30 years ago and i am proud to say that it is one of the pioneer chapters of isrs here in this isrs indore chapter we have almost uh, 64 life members and under the chairmanship of professor sk soni the chapter has now become very active and vibrant and many of these members have joined in last year and a half or say two years i would like to use this platform to appeal all the participants those who are inclined or those who are interested in the field of remote sensing and satellite please join this isrs chapter indore chapter 
sir under, under this chapter we have conducted various activities like the outreach program for the faculty and students of our institutes we have also established a center for remote sensing and satellite technology we call it as crsst last year and uh, all our these uh, life members of this chapter contribute in this crsst uh, center so this crsst is a uh, a uh, dream project of our director dr rk saxena sir he, it is very close to his heart and i am sure we will uh, make this isrs chapter more active and contribute to the development of our institute finally i am sure today's expert talk will benefit all of us and all will enjoy this talk thanks thank you very much over to you Uh, I can take over. I can take over, Dr. Khatri. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much uh, for giving a very brief uh, introduction of the chapter. Uh, as a chairman of ISS Indo chapter, I welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Prakash Chauhan, and uh, all the. is what you call the participants in this this uh, event to name of you i welcome our director dr rakit saxena who is a source of inspiration for this program also i welcome one of our old colleague dr ajay one of my the old colleague dr ajay and from having association almost two decades and i welcome all dr khatri sir as in continuation to what dr khatri has said uh, indore chapter is uh, working for almost 30 years you know call it in 1989 we conducted the annual convention of isrs and the team was engineering application of remote sensing we have conducted this remote sensing day celebration for almost 15 to 20 years continuously and we had a distinguished speakers like professor yashpal professor u rao then Professor Jairaman, Mrs. Venkatachalam from IIT uh, Bombay, and uh, A K S Gopalan, all um, space scientists. Uh, we had uh, and we had a pleasure of organizing this event as an offline event. This is for the first time in the present circumstances we are going for online, and uh, I am very happy to get associated with Professor Prakash Chauhan. my colleague uh, mr vivek tiwari he will be just introducing the speaker but i had an opportunity of meeting professor prakash chauhan uh, twice in this year only and my personal capacity my observation that he is really very dynamic and the uh, entire space program uh, of present and future i expect he is contributing and be contributing a lot so with this few words i welcome all the participants i welcome our dr saxen director also i welcome you all and i am sure the lecture or the talk which our distinguished speaker will be giving being an academic institute being a what you call working on a space technology from ground level it will be a very learning and very hard learning thanks very much sir uh, now i request uh, our director sir dr rakesh saxena to speak few words good morning to all uh, first of all best wishes to all members and all interested and connected members uh, for vikram sarabhai centenary celebration and remote sensing day which we are celebrating today by way of uh, seminar uh, i thank uh, dr prakash chauhan director iirs for giving a very good uh, lecture here on mysterious of earth moon through lumen mission uh, that is very wonderful and good topic uh, for today's uh, gsits has one center for remote sensing and satellite technology and it is attached with I isrs chapter of indore also so uh, we are working very uh, fast and uh, very deeply for remote sensing in smart city projects and everywhere 
and with this we are uh, planning for nano satellite also as per government rules uh, i i congratulate and thank dr soni uh, dr khatri mr vivek tiwari also mr bhalla and mr narulkar and all members whole team faculties and students those who are today listening this seminar and taking advantage of mr prakash chauhan um, i welcome all members from all of the country because some of uh, chauhan sahab friends are from ahmedabad also so i uh, welcome all members for this seminar and thank you thank you very much for joining this seminar thank you to all thank you thank you very much sir uh, now i will request uh, in tiwari to introduce our distinguished speaker of today's program mr vivek tiwari अंधकार से प्रकाश में लाने वाले शून्य से अनंत तक पहुंचाने वाले सभी शिक्षकों गुरुजनों और आदरणीय मुख्य वक्ता प्रकाश चौहान सर को मेरा नमन यह हमारा सौभाग्य है कि आज हमारे बीच में जो दुर्लक्षण वक्तव्य के लिए डॉक्टर प्रकाश चौहान हमारे बीच में मौजूद है यह हमारा सौभाग्य है कि मैं सर के जीवन शैली और जीवन परिचय का वाचन कर रहा हूँ डॉक्टर प्रकाश चौहान सर ऑप्टेन हिज पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट डिग्री इन अप्लाइड जियो फिजिक्स फ्रॉम आई आई टी रोड की पी एच डी इन फिजिक्स फ्रॉम गुजरात यूनिवर्सिटी अहमदाबाद प्रायर टू ज्वाइनिंग इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ रिमोट साइंसिंग आई आर एस ही वॉज ग्रुप डायरेक्टर एट इसरो अहमदाबाद सिंस टू थाउजेंड ही ज्वाइन Indian Space Research Organisation, that is ISRO, in 1991 as an eminent scientist. Since then, working for application of remote sensing technology for natural resources management for ocean and land resources, he initiated research activities for planetary remote sensing at Space Application Centre to study solar system objects mainly. Earth, Moon, and Mars, and other lunar missions through Indian planetary missions. From April 2020 onwards, he is presently holding additional charge of director CSSTEAP. His major achievements are in the area of Earth observation application, including development of algorithm for ocean color parameter. retrieval marine living resources assessments he has done lead work in the using of high spectral data to lunar surface composition mapping hysi and moon moon <coughs> mineralogical mappers he also lead a team scientist for scientist analysis of data for mars orbiter mission that is mom instruments he is executive member of international ocean color coordination group and representing his group he has also represented isro at ceo at chair for ocean color virtual constellations he has been awarded prestigious professor p r prashanti memorial award for the year 2004 2004 by the indian society of remote sensing hariyom ashram prerit dr vikram sarabhai award by physical research laboratory prl amdavad for 2009 isro merit award by <coughs> indian space research organization in 2010 satish dhawan award by isrs dehradun for 2060 he is also a fellow of national academy of sciences nsi alabad ye bahut sankshipt vivran hai hamare mukhya vakta ka main adarni mukhya vakta shri <coughs> dr prakash chauhan se anurodh karunga ki apne vaktavya se hame प्रतिबोधित करें आदरणीय चौहान सर सर का माइक म्यूट है सिद्धार्थ सर का माइक म्यूट है इसको मेरा ऑन कर दिया ओके चौहान साहब चौहान साहब 
Yeah, good morning to all of you. Namaskar. Yes, sir. Uh, are you able to hear me? And uh, yeah. yes, yes. I have, yes, 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 yes. I have, very clear. I have, very I have clear. shared. Uh, I have shared my presentation. Uh, please confirm that all of you are able to see my presentation also. Yes. Is it all right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good morning, and uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me thank. Uh, uh, Professor Soni, uh, Dr. Rakesh Sakshana, Director Sub, and Dr. Rajesh Sri, and all other organizers, and all the members of uh, Indian Society of Remote Sensing Indore chapter uh, for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to interact with all of you. Uh, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. In fact, it has been a pleasure uh, to get associated with Professor Soni. Uh, we had a couple of meetings over here. Uh, he's a very enthusiastic. Uh, you know, teacher, and uh, in this part of the country, especially in Indore and Central India, uh, with his work in the field of remote sensing, and he's uh, uh, also motivating large number of students. Uh, uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Swami Sir, uh, for connecting with us. And uh, thank you, sir. my pleasure. Uh, and uh, today we have the, this event. Uh, somehow, you know, we have to reschedule it because of some personal issues I had uh, for tomorrow's uh, uh, event. Uh, so, as uh, many of you are aware, uh, every year, you know, uh, we celebrate National Remote Sensing Day uh, to honor uh, Professor Vikram Tharabai, whose uh, birthday also uh, happens to be on August 12th, that's tomorrow. And this year is a special year because we are marking or we are celebrating the 100th uh, yeah. uh, birth, uh, uh, you know, anniversary of uh, Professor Vikram Tharabai. And uh, one year long activities, which we started last year uh, in Ahmedabad, uh, will also culminate tomorrow. And there are a lot of uh, programs which are lined up uh, for tomorrow's events uh, by various, uh, you know, organizations, in, uh, uh, including uh, uh, Indian Society of Remote Sensing. Uh, many chapters also organizing, uh, you know, lectures by very uh, eminent people. Uh, so many of you can also take advantage. The advantage is nowadays with this, this online platform that uh, the physical distances are there, but we are all virtually connected. So uh, everyone can get benefited. Even uh, ISRS, uh, indoor chapters can program can be, you know, received very well uh, everywhere. Uh, you know, all the chapters and vice versa. Uh, tomorrow, ISRS Dehradun chapter is also going to organize one lecture by Professor Ramesh P. Singh who will be joining us from Chapman University in the United States of America. And he will be talking about remote sensing for Himalayan region. Uh, I hope many of you may be aware about it. Please also join for that lecture at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, Indian Standard Time. If you, uh, uh, We will also circulate the links, etc., uh, to our uh, there have been sector friends as well. So uh, as we celebrate the birth centenary year of Professor Vikram Sarabhai, uh, uh, he was one of the greatest visionaries, and uh, he is also credited with, uh, you know, uh, uh, that he's credited that he is the person or uh, who started the Indian Space Program, and uh, he is also known as the father of Indian Space Program. So I pay my respect and uh, tribute to this great visionary leader, and with his efforts and the seeds which he has shown, sown almost 50 years back. Today's India's space program is one of the uh, finest among the all work, you know, among all the space fearing nations. And we are second to none in technology as well as in the applications of space technology for the benefit of humankind. Uh, today's talk uh, is uh, 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 on a slightly uh, different uh, topic, which many of you may be, uh, you know, accustomed to because a large amount of remote sensing community in uh, India is uh, more familiar with Earth observation remote sensing. But we thought that as remote sensing also is very important to, you know, to understand our celestial neighbors, uh, it's a, a good occasion to talk that what kind of remote sensing experiments we are conducting to know more about our own uh, Earth's moon. And uh, already we, India has, uh, you know, put two missions around the orbit of uh, Moon. Uh, as many of you may recollect, that in 2008, 
we had a successful you know flight towards moon and uh, we could uh, successfully install an orbiter called chandrayaan 1 in the orbit of uh, moon and uh, last year also there was big excitement when uh, we have upscaled the chandrayaan 1 experiment and we planned a uh, more comprehensive space system that's called chandrayaan 2 where uh, not only we were going to orbit around the surface uh, around the orbit of the moon uh, but we were also having a plan to land uh, on the south pole of the lunar surface uh, however due to certain technical difficulties uh, you know the landing was not uh, as per our expectations but our orbiter is still uh, working uh, in a very fine shape and all the experiments which are uh, which were planned from the uh, this chandrayaan 2 orbiter are uh, doing fantastically well and sending good amount of data about the moon surface. So we'll see some of these data sets today that what kind of science is being done and what information uh, we, are we are getting uh, from uh, this Chandrayaan-2 orbiter as well as we also recollect that what type of knowledge has been gained from our Chandrayaan-1 experiment. Simultaneously, uh, there is large amount of interest in uh, lunar uh, exploration by various other space agencies also. Uh, so with this, uh, you know, that uh, I start my presentation. And uh, as uh, I was just mentioning, uh, the first slide I would like to dedicate to the memory of Professor Vikram Sarabhai, uh, who has, uh, you know, uh, installed the vision of Indian Space Program with the motto that that uh, uh, a space program should provide uh, technological access for the benefit of uh, common man. And uh, this uh, has been achieved by ISRO by developing a state of art technology with the help of industry, with the help of academic institutions. And uh, we can pr uh, proudly say that it's a totally indigenous, homegrown uh, space program. Today, as we speak of Atmanirbhar Bharat, in fact, uh, Professor Sarabhai had this vision almost 50 years back itself when uh, most of the uh, you know centers in ISRO are developing their own uh, technological uh, you know fiats as well as uh, our own way of developing various societal uh, applications which is unique uh, nowhere in the world you will find this type of unique applications uh, which many of you are aware especially in the field of earth observation uh, satellite communication and location based services uh, we started uh, with the uh, firm baby steps uh, almost uh, uh, you know 50 years back or so uh, uh, we had a conviction that even though uh, we were having very primitive facilities uh, during that time but uh, already you know with the launch of sputnik one in 1957 the seeds for space exploration was already put by russians and then india also started thinking uh, in the uh, you know uh, thinking of uh, developing a uh, launch capability, especially at a village called Tumba, which is very close to the magnetic equator. And some of these old pictures of Professor Sarabhai with Pandit Nehru and, uh, you know, the sounding rockets, which basically uh, were the beginning uh, of the start of Indian space program. Some of these old pictures has been put here. So virtually, we can say from zero infrastructure with determination, commitment and leadership of uh, uh, the founding fathers as well as the subsequent uh, uh, leaders of Indian space program. Today, we are a self-reliant uh, uh, nation which has a very uh, you know, advanced space infrastructure. And uh, this is all in tune with the national development needs uh, through innovations in science and technology. Uh, as many of you may be aware, especially in the field of Earth observation, uh, you know, we are in uh, in constant touch with almost 65 ministries of government of India and large amount of private in, uh, entrepreneurs, those currently are uh, using the earth observation data for various societal uh, development. Similarly, today's topic is we are talking about the space sciences and planetary exploration. This field of activity in ISRO is also attracting large number of our youths basically involved in developing and creation of new knowledge about the solar system and the objects in our solar system. So with the kind of, you know, uh, hard work and dedication by the entire ISRO team in last 50 years or so, we have developed now capability, uh, you know, to put uh, satellites in low Earth orbit 
uh, from 500 to 900 kilometers. We have also capability to put geostationary you know, objects, geostationary satellites, which orbits around the Earth surface at 36,000 kilometers. We have also traveled to moon, not only once, but twice. LS, uh, which is around 3,85,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface, as well as, you know, we could reach uh, to Mars also in 2014, where we have covered almost 225 millions of kilometers. So uh, it's a fantastic journey over the last two years or so uh, by putting satellites into the low Earth orbit and then going all the way up to uh, Mars. Uh, and uh, many of us, those who work in ISRO, the excitement of doing new things always keeps us motivated. And that's why, uh, you know, I say uh, with pride that it's a job which gives you immense satisfaction while working for Indian Space Research Organization. Now, as far as uh, today's topic is concerned, since we are talking about space science related activities, many of you must have heard, heard about Earth observation satellite systems. But today, I will tell you that how the journey of various space science experiments has been uh, since the launch of Aryabhatta in 1975, which was a dedicated satellite for X-ray astronomy, astronomy and to understand the solar physics. And then, of course, we had SOS series of satellite systems. Then we have this some uh, you know X-ray experiments on IRS P3 in 1996. X-ray spect uh, spectrometers was also put in 2003. And then, of course, we had a big mission, you know, which has changed the dynamics of, uh, uh, you know, space science and exploration in ISRO. Uh, that was Chandrayaan-1. And uh, we will be, you know, having a much more detailed look in the kind of experiments we had with Chandrayaan-1 uh, observations, uh, which was supposed to provide information about the topography, uh, elemental abundance on the moon surface, what kind of rocks and minerals are there, and whether the big question whether moon has have water uh, in form of uh, you know in the form of solid uh, liquid or in the form of molecules. Uh, more than 150 publications came out uh, from Chandrayaan One mission, and a still large amount of uh, researchers, especially the lunar scientists, are still exploring this huge amount of data which was provided by Chandrayaan One mission. Uh, of course, we in 2011, we had a uh, mission called YouthSat. It was designed and developed by various uh, you know, students, as well as young researchers across different universities, which was supposed to give information about the uh, upper atmosphere, uh, as well as the space weather related events. Then, of course, uh, in 2013, we had the launch uh, liftoff of Mars Orbiter mission, which was supposed to go to the Martian orbit. And as we speak today, uh, the orbiter is still going around, even though it was supposed to work only for six months. But since 2014, when the insertion took place, and today it's 2020, the mission is still providing some amount of uh, data. Recently, many of you must have seen a news item that uh, Mars Orbiter mission has done imaging of one of the moon of the Mars called Phobos. And this, these, uh, these pictures were captured sometime in the month of June itself. So that shows that even though the mission was supposed to work for six months, uh, even after six years, it continues to provide very valuable data about the Martian surface. And of course, in 2015, a very interesting science uh, mission was done that's called Astroset. This was uh, to provide uh, multi wavelength observations about the stars and galaxies, especially in ultraviolet and X ray region of electromagnetic spectrum. And then, of course, last year we had this big excitement that we were planning to return to the moon. Uh, after a gap of almost 10 years or so. And we had this, uh, you know, a more comprehensive lunar mission, uh, which was consisting of uh, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. Uh, and the mission was known as Chandrayaan-2. Uh, so we'll see some of this, uh, uh, you know, some of the images and some of the data sets which has been captured by Chandrayaan-2 uh, through the course of this presentation. Of course, uh, the future is also pretty bright. Uh, ISRO is having a big emphasis uh, on uh, space exploration activities. And uh, we are also uh, now uh, you know, geared up for Chandrayaan-3, which will be, again, an attempt to land on the surface of the moon. Then we also having a very exciting mission to understand our own god. You know, <laughs> I call our god. Uh, our own god is sun, uh, because uh, it is because of the presence of the sun in our solar system, uh, our existence is there. 
So to understand more about sun, uh, it's uh, the kind of processes which, have, which occurs on the sun. Uh, uh, we are planning to uh, put a satellite in, uh, uh, in Langrangian 1 orbit, and that mission is called Aditya. As you are aware, Aditya is also a Sanskrit name of sun. Uh, so this particular mission will tell you more about the kind of uh, solar plasma activities, solar wind activities, and then coronal, coronal mass ejection activities, which happens uh, on the sun, and how does these activities, which are happening on sun, affects our own life uh, uh, at Earth, as well as uh, the solar wind, wind interactions with the upper atmosphere uh, of the Earth's surface in terms of space weather events. So very exciting missions. We are also planning to return to Mars again. There will be a future mission to Mars called MOM2. And ISRO is also contemplating and uh, very advanced work is happening to send a mission to uh, study our another uh, sister, uh, you know, neighboring planet called Venus. So there is uh, a uh, good amount of uh, work has already been done. Baseline configuration of the instruments, etc., has already been done to uh, you know, identify instruments to study Venus. So all these missions, you know, which we have launched to do lunar exploration, Martian exploration, space astronomy, uh, has provided a significant amount of knowledge in the field of space science and astronomy to build a scientific knowledge base about uh, the objects which are there, uh, you know, in our vicinity, as well as, of course, in our own galaxy. Uh, especially in context to the uh, astrosets, uh, you know, observations. Now, coming back to, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the Earth's moon, you know, this is a very interesting picture which has been captured by a satellite, um, or a, uh, an American satellite, where you can see the Earth and moon system uh, in one shot itself. So as you can see, the blue planet on which we live, and then the moon going around it, what you see, uh, is the backside of the moon, which we never see uh, from the surface of the Earth. Now, if you compare uh, both these uh, celestial objects, our own planet, the Earth, and its satellite moon, you know, the Earth has a diameter roughly around 12,700 kilometers or so. So uh, in comparison to that, as you can see from this picture as well, the moon is almost a quarter of the size, uh, which is having a diameter of roughly 3,476 uh, kilometer. Uh, Earth is tilted around 23 degrees because of that, you know, we have the seasonality, different type of uh, seasons you uh, see on the surface of Earth, uh, where Moon does not have that much tilt, it's marginally tilted on its axis around 7 degrees or so. We have very fine, nice temperatures uh, so that we can have, uh, you know, uh, existence and presence of life on the surface of Earth. However, that kind of luxury is not available on moon. Uh, so if you happen to be on the moon surface, you will be you know, subject to extreme temperature variations, which can range as high as 110 degrees Celsius on the upper side and as low as around minus 180 degrees Celsius, uh, especially if you are in the lunar polar regions. We had a cushion of a very thick uh, you know, atmosphere, which consists of uh, you know, inert uh, neutral gases uh, like uh, nitrogen, uh, oxygen, and then other greenhouse gases, uh, which protects us uh, from, uh, you know, uh, harmful radiations of the sun, as well as the meteoritic showers and meteors, which basically uh, keeps on colliding with uh, different planets. And since many of these meteors and meteorites, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, get burned out in our uh, atmosphere due to the friction, uh, the surface of the Earth is pretty safe. Uh, but similar type of luxury is not available on Moon. It does not have, uh, you know, uh, sufficiently developed atmosphere. Uh, and uh, that's why the Moon surface, uh, we will see in next slide, is highly, uh, you know, cratered uh, because of the large amount of impacts uh, which has happened over a period of time. Uh, and uh, as we speak, some of the uh, small meteorites also keeps on falling onto the moon surface. And since it does not have an a, a atmosphere around it, uh, you know, uh, it's an airless body. And uh, if you would like to go to the moon, you have to remain in a protected environment because uh, uh, if you have to maintain the surface, uh, the pressure of your body, as well as if you have to breathe, uh, because we cannot survive without oxygen, you have to carry all these things to moon along with you. 
uh, water, which is uh, very much essential for uh, building, uh, which is known as the building block of the life, where the water is the life is uh, life follows. Uh, on Earth, we have plenty of water. In fact, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans, uh, which are full of water. However, it may be saline water, but it plays an important role in a hydrological cycle uh, over the Earth's surface. And we get plenty of fresh water by in the form of precipitation uh, in liquid as well as in solid forms. But uh, again, on our moon, there is not uh, no evidence uh, of liquid water. And then uh, we suspect, in fact, there are observations which have confirmed that there could be presence of uh, water ice, especially in the polar regions of the uh, moon surface, both in the South Pole as well as in the North Pole uh, areas. Uh, now, what is the uh, interest about uh, knowing the Earth's moon? Uh, you know, why uh, people are bothered to know about uh, Earth's moon? If Earth, uh, the moon itself, is a very, uh, you know, dynamic body, it's not going to be, uh, you know, conducive for supporting life. Uh, why the hell we should worry about it? You know, however, as we know, the humans uh, have inquisitive nature. They have curiosity, as well as we are also resource-hungry people. You know, our population on this planet is also increasing. Uh, our demands for resources uh, is increasing every day. And uh, people have made, uh, you know, calculations that the way we are growing in number, uh, you know, the earth will not be sufficient for us. And in fact, after certain times, we will be requiring almost 1.5 earth. You know, that means one earth we have with us, but another half of the earth you have to have from where to get the resources. Uh, where you will look for. Uh, so naturally, uh, the closest object to us is moon, which is, as I told, on an average distance is around uh, 384,000 kilometers and with good spacecraft systems now available. Uh, so even the private sector is uh, coming into big way. You all must have seen the uh, Elon Musk's, uh, you know, SpaceX and their years. Uh, it's not difficult to go to the moon in uh, you know, two days or so or three days or so and then return back and uh, so that's why the the race for the lunar resources is hotting up uh, so there are scientific uh, you know uh, questions uh, especially how did our moon form and then what has been happening on the moon since its formation uh, around four uh, billion years back uh, what kind of myths are there uh, about the moon? You know, many of you must have heard about a lot of folklores and stories uh, from your grandmas and grand, uh, you know, fathers about the uh, various things happening on the moon surface. We want to demystify some of those things as well as, as I told you in the beginning, the lunar resources. Uh, you know, the large amount of uh, mineral resources which are present on the moon surface, and uh, if we can extract that in you know times to come, probably. Uh, it will provide uh, enough resources for humanity uh, to grow and develop the way we would like to uh, develop in future. So these are some of those things which are driving exploration for the moon. And uh, this is evident uh, in the form of large number of missions by different countries, which has been planned uh, to, which has been sent in uh, future, as well as there is a good uh, plan uh, for future exploration of moon also. So if, if you see country-wise, United States and uh, Russia, of course, the old USSR, uh, you know, they had almost 60, 56 kind of missions, you know, especially they started in early 60s or so, uh, sending large amount of, uh, you know, space missions to moon as part of the uh, Cold War between US and America, US and USSR. Uh, of course, uh, you know, you can see the success rate also that uh, the blue color shows the total number of mission. And then, of course, the light blue color shows you the uh, successful mission. So if you see even US, they have almost launched more than 60 missions. However, out of 60, only 38 was successful. A uh, few of them were landing missions also. So the failure rates were much higher in that case. Uh, similarly, China is another big player where China is a very extensive lunar exploration program. They have already sent uh, four missions to the moon and they are now planning a sample return moon uh, mission from uh, moon. Uh, similarly, Japan, in India, we have made uh, two of attempts, and uh, uh, first attempt and second attempt, both were successful. Uh, second was partially successful, but uh, I will say that it was almost 90% uh, successful. And then Europe is also having its own uh, presence. And then, of course, Israel, uh, two years back, uh, one year back, I think in 2019, they attempted a landing on the 
moon surface rover which failed. Uh, so this is uh, how the activity about uh, exploration of moon is going around the world and the major space players, uh, America, Russia, China, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, they're all uh, uh, you know, involved uh, into uh, the lunar exploration. And uh, as many of you are aware, uh, where last year we also celebrated the 50th anniversary of the, uh, of the Apollo missions uh, in 1969, when the, the humans were put by Americans onto the uh, moon surface. So uh, moon exploration is not new. Uh, it has been going on almost uh, since uh, half of the century or so. And large amount of information about the moon is available by many of these experiments and missions which has been done by various uh, you know, space agencies. Uh, so if we have to categorize uh, the science theme, you know, why scientists or the lunar scientists wants to uh, study moon, you know, the four broad categories are there. That is first, we would like to understand that uh, you know how the planet uh, you know formed itself what was uh, happening or what was the early uh, earth and moon system look like and then uh, solar system impact record as i told you the moon does not have atmosphere so when the so the uh, solar system was developing uh, when the new sun was formed and the planets were forming around the uh, sun large amount of impacts were happening and these impacts have created their marks and these marks are still available on the moon surface uh, however on a planet like earth where large amount of processes like uh, uh, plate tectonics erosion by wind by water and other uh, erosion agents is happening all that history uh, of uh, impact uh, records uh, has been washed away but all those things are preserved onto the moon surface because virtually there is uh, not much of erosion happening onto the moon surface uh, by water, rain, and wind. Uh, so moon becomes a very nice laboratory for geologists or geoscientists to study the uh, early uh, you know, uh, evolution of our planetary system. And of course, from the uh, human presence point of view, we would also like to know more about the lunar environment. You know, What kind of temperature variability, what kind of radiation hazards are there, uh, what kind of uh, you know other hazards, especially in terms of lunar dust, etc., uh, will have uh, will be there when uh, humans starts you know having uh, mass presence onto the moon surface. So these are the themes which are deriving a very broad and interesting uh, science uh, uh, you know uh, topic, uh, which is known as uh, lunar science. Uh, so if you look into the questions which uh, people have tried to answer, that how does moon probably must have you know formed because as you know this is a satellite of our a natural satellite of our earth so it goes around our, our surface uh, earth's uh, orbit uh, uh, and it is uh, attached to the earth uh, in a gravitational uh, you know balance system uh, so the uh, there are theories which base tries to explain uh, that how moons are formed and one of the theory is known as the giant impact theory uh, according to this theory that uh, uh, a Mars, you know, size object, uh, a meteorite or a asteroid probably, uh, which was having, which was of the size of Mars, probably has hit the early, uh, you know, Earth, uh, and this giant impact basically produced large amount of ejecta, uh, which started going uh, around the uh, early Earth system. Uh, so it says that it, probably with this theory, you can say that some. Earth material itself scooped out and started going around the Earth surface, and with you know going around, and a large amount of material started accreting, and a you know a circular ball was formed, and this started you know going around the Earth surface and uh, formed its own natural satellite. Uh, so uh, this particular hypothesis or theory is known as the giant impact theory, and we scientists try to find out uh, you know the evidences to prove this theory, uh, some of the observations which has been made, especially in terms of the bulk density of moon, bulk density of our earth, elements which are found on earth, elements which are found of moon, they have large amount of commonality. And this, this has you know, led to believe, uh, a belief that probably a moon must have formed from the earth itself. And as the, uh, you know, uh, this uh, ball which started, you know, going around the primitive earth, 
there is another hypothesis which is known as the uh, magma ocean hypothesis which suggests that how the present day moon must have formed so the early moon was basically a partially molten body which was going around the earth and slowly with the passage of time this body started cooling off and when this type of process happens in geology this is known as differentiation and in differentiation process uh, what happens that the uh, the heavier elements uh, which is present in this molten soup uh, they start sinking because of the internal gravitational attraction and the lighter elements like calcium uh, silica etc they starts floating when uh, you know the body cools off the upper crust will be made of the lighter elements and the internal uh, structure of any planetary body will be basically made of the heavier elements uh, like iron, nickel, cobalt, magnesium, etc. So this uh, hypothesis you know, is known as ocean, magma ocean hypothesis. And this probably has led uh, to a crust or the upper surface of the moon. Uh, geologists call them anorthosite. Essentially, they are basically minerals uh, like uh, plagioclase, uh, plagioclase feldspar, which is made of calcium, aluminium, silicates. And then, of course, you have in the, uh, as you go down, probably you will find uh, more mafic or iron rich minerals like uh, olivine and pyroxenes. And of course, uh, uh, you know, more of, uh, which, which contain more of, uh, you know, heavier elements like magnesium and iron. Uh, so probably a very simple geological formation has happened on the moon. And since not much of weathering, all alteration of these minerals has happened over a period of time. The geology of the moon is pretty simple, and many of the rocks are made of uh, feldspar uh, minerals like olivine and pyroxenes. We'll talk more in detail about these minerals and how these minerals are distributed on the surface of uh, of the uh, of the moon. Now, <clears throat> what I would like to tell you more in this talk is the remote sensing experiments. Large amount of imaging experiments are being done to understand the morphology, morphotectonics, and the morphological features which are present on the uh, moon surface, rather than talking about the interiors. So as you can see, as I was telling you, uh, you know, we cannot see the backside of the moon from the Earth's surface because they are tidally logged. And this is how the near surface looks like. This is the surface which you see every day uh, from uh, your naked eye on a full moon day. Uh, you all can see, you know, two distinct uh, you know, um, colors. One is this darker region over here, uh, which absorbs uh, reflected light of sun, and then the brighter region, which basically appears much bright. Uh, and this region is called uh, island region, uh, which is made of this uh, feldspathic rocks or the calcium bearing rocks. And these darker regions are basically made of uh, basalts, uh, which are basically the rock forms which has more you know heavier elements, especially iron. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, titanium. Okay, so uh, so so this but these type of rocks they absorb large amount of solar radiation. That is why they appear dark. And then of course this uh, you know brightly reflecting rock types called anorthosites. So these are the two broad uh, you know units on the moon surface. You see from your uh, you know for even from naked eye or with a good uh, telescope or with a camera. 3040x uh, zoom camera, you will be able to see many of these impact craters also. So even these dark regions, they are basically nothing but the impact craters. You can see the circular shapes. And then, of course, there are large amount of impact craters uh, all along the, uh, the surface of the moon. Uh, when you come towards the backside you know, of the moon, this, as I told you, cannot be seen from the surface of Earth. So this is an image composite which has been you know, captured by satellite observations and mosaic of the satellite uh, images has been created to uh, generate this full surface of the moon. So here you can see these darker regions are very less. Most of the regions on the backside of the moon, they are made of highland rocks. And uh, one common thing between the uh, near side and the, the far side is that this far side also is heavily cratered. You can see this large amount of impact craters on the surface of the moon. So uh, if you look the moon from close quarters, you know, uh, close observations, it doesn't, it does not have a pretty, you know, face. Uh, the face is, uh, uh, you know, impacted by large amount of meteorites and a large amount of craters are there onto the moon surface. Nothing to be compared with beautiful faces uh, as the poets compare here on Earth, you know, to the 
uh, you know some beautiful people are compared with the uh, with the with the moon <laughs> but if you see the moon from close quarter it doesn't it has a pretty ugly face okay so now i quickly come to our chandrayaan one experiments uh, many of you may be aware so i will not uh, go into details of this this was a international mission and almost uh, more than 11 uh, experiments were there but as far as the remote sensing experiments were we had high resolution imaging camera and then of course uh, you know there was a lunar laser ranging uh, experiment where a laser you know pulse was thrown towards the moon surface and when it returns uh, the two way travel time was interpreted in terms of topographic variations and then of course we had this hyperspectral images which were supposed to uh, you know measure the reflected energy in different wavelengths there were three such kind of hyperspectral images one from india one from germany and one from america uh, and of course there was a synthetic aperture radar which uh, basically worked in s band frequency mainly to uh, you know explore the water ice in the permanently shadowed region of the polar uh, south pole and north pole of uh, moon uh, uh, a good amount of data even though the chandrayaan one mission worked only for 9 months but almost you can say 80% of the moon surface was covered uh, in terms of uh, imaging payloads uh, by the chandrayaan one observations and huge amount of data has been deposited so what you see this is the type of coverage only this dark areas uh, which could not be covered because the mission could the mission lasted only 9 months or so but this data which was uh, provided by the experiments which i just talked to you uh, was so huge that it basically made big discoveries and as we were talking earlier more than 200 scientific publications have already been published by international researchers not the only the indian researchers but researchers from america japan europe they're all having access to this data because this data is freely available and many of the young uh, you know uh, students and research scholars if they are interested uh, in lunar science they can also get access to this data uh, both from international uh, websites as well as from indian websites so this analysis of this data you know if we have to say that what were the three major scientific findings so it led to you know complete uh, uh, you know uh, com uh, what i should say, you know i should say that complete change of belief what uh, lunar scientists are having about the moon uh, people were thinking that moon is bone dry there is no no presence of water uh, the moon is geologically dead Uh, there is nothing much happening over there but all these myths were demystified and uh, what we found that moon has a tenuous but active hydrosphere uh, hydrosphere means that there is a kind of hydration in terms of presence of water and there is a kind of an active hydrological cycle which is not very active like the way we have on earth surface but in terms of molecules of water there is a there is production of water molecules there is transport of these water molecules and then deposition of these water molecules this complete cycle happens on the moon uh, which is basically linked with the interaction of solar wind with the lunar dust and uh, lunar uh, you know uh, rocks uh, similarly it was also found that moon is not geologically dead even though it's a small body the internal heat is not good enough to sustain active volcanic activity today but we found presence of younger volcanic activity of the order of 100 million years or so which was also not known earlier and we also found evidences of large amount of faults lobate scarps and wrinkle ridges which suggest that uh, moon is pretty geologically dynamic active dynamically dynamically active as well as there are large amount of evidences were found with high resolution imaging data of 5 meters or less that there is a significant amount of boulder movements you know there are big boulders similarly the way you have landslide activities in the himalayan region or in a topographically dominated region on moon also uh, you know similar type of landslides do occur and good amount of boulder uh, you know movement has been recorded by many uh, researchers Uh, which is basically suggesting that currently also some kind of geological activity happens on the moon surface and then third that how does you know the moon has formed so this ocean magma hypothesis which was hypothesis early uh, we found good amount of evidences to support this hypothesis uh, so that 
uh, we can conclusively say that yes moon probably must have developed uh, you know through this uh, global uh, magma ocean uh, processes and uh, currently we found that at many places the the dominating rock is uh, you know feldspar uh, pegeo case uh, simply because we got large amount of observation from our hyperspectral cameras uh, which has proved the presence of this rock everywhere onto the uh, moon surface so these were the three major findings of the analysis uh, which was done uh, uh, for the uh, data which was collected from chandrayaan 1 observations i will go through very quickly some of the images which was captured because these are very fascinating and interesting images to many of you uh, those who are first time seeing uh, the lunar pictures so just uh, in uh, uh, very small time uh, it's a process uh, of impact cratering which is dominating the moon surface and as you can see when an impactor impacts the moon surface you know a small transient cavity is formed material is splashed out and then suddenly within few seconds you know the entire uh, process uh, happens and then you start you you get a big crater and some of these craters they are uh, big enough to produce this central hump or what we call as the central rise and they are known as the uh, complex craters i will show you some of the examples of these craters which are of different types they tells you about the history a uh, geological history what has been preserved on to the moon surface so you have micron size of uh, craters called pit craters uh, craters which are having diameter of 1 km or so they are called simple craters then you have craters which are of the order of 28 km or so in diameter and has well developed central rise or central hump they are called complex craters then you have craters which are of the order of 300 km or so they are normally called as the peak ring basins you can see there is one ring and then there is a secondary ring and then of course there are large impact craters which are having diameters of around 1000 km or so they are called multi ring basins and uh, one such example is a crater called oriental crater uh, on moon surface you can see multiple rings one ring is here second ring is here third ring is here so uh, this is a very complex uh, you know impact uh, process uh, which you can see in the form of multi ring uh, basins Uh, i will just show you some of these example this is simple crater over here uh, uh, where you can see the bright uh, ejected material and then some of this ejected material is thrown away uh, into the uh, distal part uh, and of course the background is much darker because of the space weathering this is another impact crater this is around 5 km diameter impact crater which has the darker region around it they are called dark halo craters uh, this is another beautiful complex crater Uh, on the southern hemisphere of the moon this you can see from your naked eye also or maybe a good uh, binocular or uh, a high uh, zoom camera itself if you use in the southern hemisphere there is a very young crater around uh, 100 million year old crater called tycho crater this has been named uh, after brahme tycho who was a famous astronomer from europe and this crater when you see from uh, you know 50 km orbit you know you you start seeing the well developed rims of the crater this is a 3d image which we have generated using our terrain mapping camera from chandrayaan 1 there is a well developed central hill here this hill has an elevation of roughly around 2 km or so from the bottom and then these are the rims of this crater and uh, from here to here there is a elevation drop of around 4 km or so so if you make a jump into this to the surface of the crater you will be fall in around 4 km and then there are well developed terraces uh, uh, across the rim of this particular crater so such type of craters are called the complex crater where there is a well developed central rise so uh, the diameter of this particular crater is 85 km so from this flank to this flank the distance is roughly 85 km or so so these are all massive craters uh, of course they are there are much larger craters on moon uh, which are having diameters of hundreds of kilometer uh, this is less than 100 kilometer but very fascinating impact crater uh, on moon uh, on the moon surface we also did uh, high resolution imaging of this crater central peak and uh, you take a look that this is at 5 meter spatial resolution uh, you can see large amount of you know cracks which are developed onto the the central rise there is also evidences of granular flow uh, you know a sliding uh, landslide kind of uh, situation happening over, over here then there are depressions where uh, you know what we call as the impact melts they are being trapped and then of course there are cracks on the surface of the 
lunar surface. Uh, typically, these cracks develop on the Earth's surface also. But here, because of the large temperature difference uh, between day and night uh, onto the moon surface, some of this type of uh, cracks can also develop because of uh, the thermal inertia which is produced on the onto the moon surface. Uh, this is another interesting, uh, you know, geomorphological uh, expression. How does this impact melts? You know, what happens? Large amount of these impacts, they come with high velocity and they hit the surface and immediately the surface will get melted and this melt start flowing. So this is a typical example of an impact melt which has flowed uh, over the moon surface and with time it has got uh, frozen. Uh, so you can see this waviness here, over here, and then of course the cooling cracks, etc., which is very distinct from the uh, surrounding. So, so at large locations on moon, you will find such type of impact melts, the melts which are produced because of the impact cratering. There's another beautiful crater on the far side or the back side of the moon. It's called Slovisky Crater. So this is the main crater boundary. And you can see a distinct color change. The interior of this crater is dark. It is simply because it is made of basaltic rocks. The impact was so high that it punctured the, uh, the upper crust of the moon. And then the upper mantle get exposed, which is rich in basaltic rocks. And slowly, uh, this volcanic melt, it is uh, cooled down. And it produced the basaltic rocks, which are basically uh, which look black in color. You must have also seen this type of uh, rocks in your surroundings, especially in Maratwara region, where you have the black cotton soil, etc. Uh, so similar type of situation is there onto the uh, on the on the moon also. And this is the central rise of the Slovisky crater, where also you will find beautiful exposure of different type of rocks. Another interesting crater called Theophilus crater is a three dimensional image which we have recreated of all these craters using elevation information from our terrain mapping camera, which was a studio, uh, studio mission. And um, uh, combining this 3D and 2D information, we could make these three dimensional uh, you know, images uh, of these craters. So, this crater, Slovisky, is also a central rise uh, dominated crater. It's a complex crater. At many locations, you find beautiful exposures of uh, you know minerals like which are basically you can call rubies uh, or spinels normally geologists call them in common language call them rubies they are like this many of you find in these rubies in uh, madhya pradesh also so similar type of mineral resources are available onto the moon surface <coughs> there is another big crater 1000 kilometers uh, large impact crater which is known as multi ring basin so you have this one base ring, then second ring, and tertiary ring. Within these rings also, you know, subsequent uh, events of impact cratering also can be seen. So there are craters which are superimposed within this multi-ring basin can also be seen. And then the morphology of these craters is also very distinct. So you can see this is a complex crater with a centralized, with almost uh, similar size, uh, shape, uh, uh, and size. This crater is not a... Uh, complex crater. There is no well-developed central rise simply because this crater is in the basaltic terrain. So the crater formation will be of different nature depending on the parent rock or the host rock itself. Uh, similarly, here also you can see there is a complex crater and then small, small crater everywhere. So these craters, they become very important scientific uh, locations to understand the internal or the interiors of the moon surface also because at many locations, the, the inner rocks with the blast or with the impact, the inner rocks will be coming to the surface. And you can get the exposure of these rocks onto the surface of the moon. And then do uh, later on with the spectroscope, you can also study their composition. Uh, this is another very interesting image. Uh, this is from Chandrayaan 2, where we have uh, you know, taken a shot of the moon from a far, far off distance, and a good amount of moon was exposed. This is the picture of Oriental Basin. And all along in Oriental, you can see this lines of impact craters, you know, these, these lineations or linear features. These are basically nothing but what we call the secondary impact craters. So what happens when you have a big uh, impactor impacting moon, large amount of material will be ejected. And this ejected material will travel in one linear fashion. And then you know this, this will be keep on dropping. And then this will produce this type of secondary craters. Uh, so this is a beautiful expression of the secondaries over here. You can see just like a bullet, you know, somebody has punctured this beautiful linear patterns which has been created by this primary impact. So with this type of uh, images, you can also calculate, do the back calculation that if 
uh, what would be the size of the impactor, what would be the angle of approach of this impact, and how much distance this energy, um, you know, um, energy which produced this impact, uh, to what distance secondary craters must have uh, formed, that also tells you the ener energetics of the uh, primary uh, event. So uh, there are a good amount of papers on, especially on the secondary impact craters of Oriental Basin, where scientists have tried to reconstruct the entire history of the impact by analyzing the distance, the shape, and size of secondary impact craters. Of course, this is another example of secondary craters. Some of this, this big crater material is fallen over here. And you can see uh, these are all the secondary impacts, not the primary impacts. There's another crater, you know, this looks like a thali, you know, <laughs> in which we eat the food. Uh, but it's a pretty large size, but there is no central peak over here. Primarily, it is uh, the crater has been formed on the soft rocks, which are basaltic rocks in this case, compared to uh, much harder rocks like, uh, you know, pegeoclase or the, uh, the brightly reflecting uh, rocks onto the moon surface. Similarly, there are other morphological entities, uh, which we call as the, uh, you know, sinus rails. So this is one such sinus rail. Uh, people earlier thought that these are the rivers because they look like you know linear uh, river riverine features. Uh, but of course they were they are like river features. But uh, the water was not flowing in these things. The the volcanic lava was used to flow uh, during the volcanic event when moon was volcanically active. And uh, later on when uh, the lava will cool off, this uh, you know the tubes will collapse. The roof of the tube will collapse. And one such uh, tube uh, was identified by our colleagues uh, in SAC, where you know there was an uncollapsed portion, and probably this can be used uh, as a shelter for uh, possible future, future uh, human exploration. There's another uh, you know interesting example of this sinus rail. It's called Rima Hadley sinus rail. Uh, there's another big uh, lava tube uh, at a, around Apollo 15 landing site. This is the field photograph, actual image of the this lava tube which was captured by Apollo 15 astronauts. This is the astronaut at this location. And uh, this is the satellite image. So this is a depression, actually. So this kind of a pit is there. And this pit goes along, takes a turn, and then goes uh, uh, to the other direction. Uh, there are large hundreds of kilometer length such type of you know uh, lunar rails are present onto the moon surface. So these are some of the examples of this reverse of lava flows uh, onto the uh, moon surface, which has been captured by our uh, you know, remote sensing uh, satellites. So these are the imaging satellites. Then we have the spectroscopic observations also, uh, where you make the measurements of the reflected energy in different wavelengths. And uh, in different wavelengths, different rocks will be you know, showing uh, different ca absorption characteristics of light. Uh, so once you know these absorption characteristics, you can you know, find out what type of rocks must be present. So for each rock, there is a distinct spectral signature. And with this distinct spectral signature, if you make hyperspectral observations, you will be able to reinterpret the type of rocks and the type of minerals which are present onto the moon surface. So using this type of three spectrometers, uh, a global mineralogy of the moon has been derived. So all what you see in the red color is nothing but the highland feldspathic rocks. Then in the blue color is the basaltic rocks, which are pyroxene dominated. Those who are geologists, probably they will try to understand, or they will they can understand the difference between pyroxene and olivin. Their you know magnesium and iron contents are slightly varying, uh, variable. So that's how that is linked with the evolution of these rocks in terms of their depth uh, from the uh, what depth this uh, magma must have come out. All those kind of evolution of the basaltic processes, volcanic processes can be understood by understanding this, uh, by interpreting these color variations. Uh, similarly, we have also you know, developed some methods for high resolution lithological mapping. So this is at the central peak of the Tycho crater. You can see earlier I showed you black and white mon uh, you know, mono color images. But when you start uh, you know, combining the multispectral data with the high resolution data, you start seeing the changes in the uh, you know, color. And that change in the color depicts the rock type variation. So this blue color is more uh, iron rich dominated you know, rocks. And the uh, yellow or brownish color is basically the impact melt in this region. So this kind of high resolution uh, you know, rock uh, discrimination is also possible with, the, with satellite remote sensing, uh, which you do for the lunar surface today. 
uh, using this spectral analysis, you know, people were also able to identify different type of uh, minerals or the new minerals, which I talked about, like spinels or the rubies, which were found at Theophilus at many other locations. This was a new finding. In fact, it was not known. So a new mineral discovery was done by some of our colleagues in, in uh, India itself. And of course, later on, many other international people also uh, did similar work. Uh, so this is uh, about water, uh, you know, people found water also on the moon surface. All these blue regions are basically the regions which are dominated by the water molecules. And the basis of this discovery was that using this hyperspectral observation from 2600 micron to 3600 micron, you know, these are the spectral signatures of hydroxyls, water as well as ice. So there, there are distinct spectral absorption lines uh, for these three uh, you know, this, uh, these three things like hydroxyls, water, and ice. So if you are able to find out uh, from your observation these spectral lines, you can interpret the presence of water as well as, uh, you know, water ice uh, onto the moon surface. So similar thing was done uh, using this moon mineralogy mapper data. And uh, people, uh, you know, some of the colleagues in US, they generated this global image of the presence of water molecule in the polar region, especially in the North Pole and in the but later on, some of our colleagues in India also, my colleagues at SAC, uh, you know, our team that those days, we also found that not only in the polar regions, but in the equatorial region also, similar type of absorption lines were present. And uh, they were present on a con consistent basis because here the temperature can be as high as 150 degrees Celsius during daytime. So if it is a surfacial water molecule, it will evaporate. But my, we found that on different uh, observational cycle, this uh, this type of you know uh, absorption lines were not going away. So it suggested that probably this is part of the rock uh, structure itself. And later on, we term this as the internal or the magmatic water, which is present in the rocks itself. And this also became a new discovery, uh, and uh, it was uh, very widely uh, you know accepted. And then later on, at many locations, various scientists found the presence of this internal or magmatic water. Uh, what about the water in the ice form? You know, so polar regions, which I was telling you, uh, using um, optical data as well as microwave radar data, uh, you know, uh, scientists are now in a position to say with certain, uh, you know, degree of confidence that there is a good amount of presence of water ice, especially in the polar regions, both in the North Pole and the South Pole. So the polar regions has become now the hotbed for exploration, uh, for especially the human exploration. Because if we have to go to the moon, at least we will need water. Uh, so we need not carry water if we go to these locations where water ice is present. So by melting this water, by doing some basic chemistry, we will be able to generate liquid water as well as hydrogen and oxygen can be separated for other uh, you know, human requirements. So this, there's a big research going on uh, by the lunar science community to confirm and to find out the uh, water ice presence uh, either on the surface or in the subsurface region. These are the, some of the expressions of the young volcanic activities onto the moon surface. I will not spend much time on this, but what I would like to show you the kind of faults which you see even on the moon, the typical faulted regimes, what you see on the Earth's surface suggest that some kind of you know uh, active tectonics must be present onto the moon surface. That means the internal heat is. Uh, still there, which is driving the moon surface to present, to show up this type of signatures of faults and wrinkle ridges and other crumbled features onto the surface of the moon. Uh, you see, this is another region over here uh, in the Mare Oriental region. You can find out large amount of scarps, etc., where uh, the lunar surface has got, uh, you know, as, uh, got uh, pretty deformed at various locations. So this is scarp, if you do a three-dimensional mapping of this scarp, you will find a drop of elevation, you know, 100 meters or so. So this type of features, uh, you know, the geological features suggest that probably moon is uh, uh, pretty dynamic and uh, it's not, uh, uh, you know, completely uh, geologically dead as perceived earlier by various uh, lunar scientists. Uh, so uh, the large amount of data present, you know, this is one hour is not good enough to show you everything, uh, but uh, there are a lot of challenges which is still there. Uh, which uh, could not be addressed by Chandrayaan-1. Um, various other missions were planned early, later on, like Chandrayaan-2 by India, Chang'e mission from uh, from Chinese, then Selene-2 is a mission now, which is from Japan. 
uh, all these missions are basically going to extend the findings of uh, Chandrayaan-1. And uh, uh, to extend these, uh, some of these observations, we also planned this Chandrayaan-2 last year, which has this, uh, you know, uh, uh, rover uh, lander. And then there was a rover inside this. This is uh, the Vikram lander and then Pragyan rover. And then, of course, the orbiter was, was carrying all the two uh, on its head. And they were all approaching towards moon. And we were having a plan to uh, put this lander on the south pole of the moon. And once the lander lands, the rover will come out and it will make in situ measurements uh, about the geology of the moon surface. So this was the experiment. Uh, however, as many of you are aware, uh, just before reaching to the moon surface, around 200 meters or so, uh, we lost the contact with the lander uh, and rest is history. However, uh, the orbiter, which was having this five uh, wonderful instrument to extend the science which we did from Chandrayaan 1 uh, is uh, still working. That means there is a uh, L and S band synthetic aperture radar. Earlier we had only one frequency. Now we have two frequencies. And uh, help with the help of these two frequencies, we will be able to unambiguously establish the presence of water ice. Then we have also extended the spectral range uh, from uh, the earlier spectral range was around the point uh, 0.4 to 3 microns. Now we are going up to 5 microns to confirm the presence of water ice as well as water molecule. And then uh, to study the dynamics of this water uh, by doing multiple observations at certain locations. We are repeating this high resolution experiment called TMC2 once again to generate the three dimensional structure of the moon. And of course, to understand the time, very subtle or tennis lunar atmosphere, we also have a mass spectrometer which tells you about the kind of uh, elements and the molecules that are present around the, uh, around the surface of moon, uh, not, uh, which are not linked to the surface, but which are around the surface, uh, what you call as the exosphere of the moon. And of course, there is an X-ray experiment also. Uh, you know, there is an incoming X-ray measurement instrument called uh, XSM. And then the uh, once the X-ray uh, X-rays they hit the moon surface, they also do fluorescence, and then that, that fluorescence uh, signal ca carries the information about the elements which are present on the moon surface, and this will be detected by an instrument called CLASS. So these five instruments are perfectly working, and, and I'll show you. Some of these, of course, the, we had lander payloads also and rover payloads, but anyway, none of this is working today because uh, we were not, uh, uh, this could not be successfully installed. Uh, so some of these early images of Chandrayaan 2, we had celebrated uh, this last month itself, one year, and a good amount of data from Chandrayaan 2 mission is available. This is a closer approach to the moon, as I showed you this uh, image earlier, this oriental basin, and then this linear you know, uh, features of uh, uh, secondary impact craters from uh, from Oriental was captured by our land camera uh, as we were approaching. We also have a very high resolution imaging camera, which has a capability of resolve around 20 centimeter object onto the moon surface. And these are some of the images of this camera called Orbiter High Resolution Camera. As you can see, the small boulders uh, onto the moon surface, which are stuck to the lunar dust, are also very much visible. And of course, this darker region is the shadow regions of the impact crater. And some of this, uh, you know, knuckle-like features, you know, you can see their long shadows. They are, you know, kind of rocks which are protruding out of the lunar dust. And uh, with this uh, shadow itself, one can interpret and one can establish that what will be the height of these knuckles over the uh, over these. Uh, uh, lunar uh, locations. Then, of course, we are now again generating the 3D maps uh, using our TMC data. These are some of the topographic map, digital elevation model of moon uh, is being derived. And using this digital elevation data, one can see the topographic variability, uh, which is there, which is present at different locations on the moon. This is the very young, fresh crater, uh, which has been captured by terrain mapping camera uh, on Chandrayaan 2. You can see this uh, uh, the 3D uh, map of this crater, as well as uh, when we combine the 2D expressions with 3D data sets, how does this impact crater look like? How does this race out of this crater, they travel in different directions? Uh, beautifully, these are captured. This is another interesting image of the flank of this crater over here. And what you can see, some of you, if you focus in one of this region, this is the high uh, area and this is the lower areas. Large amount of boulder movements are uh, happening in this area. So you can see there is a crack here in this surface and some of the small, small boulders 
they are traveling. In fact, one of these boulders has fallen over here from here. So these are all things which basically shows you that good amount of geological activity still keeps on happening. Some of the boulders are stuck up here uh, at the flanks of this crater. And many such locations, the type of boulder movement have been noticed. Uh, we also have this uh, frequency Chandrayaan-2 uh, you know, uh, synthetic aperture radar imager, and that is also providing fabulous data onto the moon surface in uh, L and S band. And uh, this is also helping us because L band can penetrate uh, into the lunar surface. So this is helping us in detecting this ejecta. Uh, otherwise, if you see the visible images, you will not be able to see this expression uh, due to the uh, the volume scattering, uh, which is present, which, which normally happens when you have this uh, ejected material uh, uh, well below the surface of uh, you know top surface simply because uh, in l band we are able to penetrate more and this penetrated energy as captured by sar shows you the expressions of the ejected material at many uh, locations so when we combine the optical observations and the microwave observations the interpretability in terms of surface as well as subsurface uh, features uh, it uh, significantly to get enhanced, as well as now observations are also there by our colleagues, uh, especially to confirm the presence of water ice both in uh, North and South Pole. Probably some of this work is under uh, publication, so I am not supposed to, uh, you know, show it until it is published. Uh, however, we expect a very, uh, you know, advanced scientific work uh, from our Chandrayaan to orbiter, which will. Uh, we a kind of natural extension of the knowledge which we gained from our Chandrayaan 1 mission. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, you know, in the end, I would like to say, even though we have gained good amount of knowledge, how does our moon works, what kind of processes uh, happens over there, uh, whether water is present, water ice is present or not, what kind of geology uh, resources are there, what type of minerals are there, what type of rocks are there. Uh, still, there are many enigmatic features on Moon, which is uh, not understood by many scientists. One such feature, as you can see over here, is known as the lunar swills. You can see a very, you know, uh, uh, a, a curved like, uh, you know, uh, albedo variations on the Moon's surface. Uh, why does such type of albedo variations happen? What is the origin? How does uh, you know, such type of features get formed onto the moon surface, probably much more understanding is required. So what uh, I would expect that many of the young people, especially those who are uh, geologists, geographers, geoscientists, uh, physicists, because large amount of physics, especially in terms of solar wind interaction with the lunar surface, also can uh, help in solving many of these enigmatic kind of questions and myths about the moon. Probably all uh, you young guys, if you get enough motivated by this type of pictures which I shown you, probably you can take up uh, advanced research uh, problems and become uh, active lunar scientists. With this, I would like to thank each one of you for uh, giving your time and listening to me with uh, patience. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Being a chairman of the ISIS Indore chapter, and in my personal capacity also, I, I would like to express my thanks for giving such a very informative lecture. Now I will request uh, our Dr. Sanjana Jain to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Dr. Mrs. Sanjana Jain. Yeah, sir. So very good morning to all of you. So it's a very pride moment that we could become a part of the sanitary year of uh, Sarab, uh, Dr. Sarabhai. And you have given a very nice lecture, uh, Prakash Johan, sir. Uh, sir, myself, Anjana Jain. I am a professor here in electronics in TC department. So we all are very like delighted to have or uh, to be aware of the mysteries of the moon, as you say. And I think uh, there are the number of mysteries, as in the last you have mentioned, are to be solved. So I hope we, under the guidance of the scientists like you and under the, sci under the guidance of the scientists who are in the Dehradun uh, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing and in ISRO and in other 
Institute of the India will be able to resolve these mysteries. I am really very thankful to you, Dr. Prakash Johan sir, that you have very nicely explained, in a very exhaustive and simple way you have explained and given the details of the mysteries of the moon and make us aware. We are uh, the participants of all the disciplines so. And uh, we are very thankful to the Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, Dehradun. We are thankful to the in a chapter of remote sensing, Indo chapter, Professor Siddha Sumi, sir, uh, our honorary secretary, Khatri, sir, the coordinator, Vivek Tiwari, and the team member. And a part of all this, we are very thankful to our director, sir, who is very visionary and took an initiative to conduct uh, this lecture on this day, Remote Sensing Day. We are really very much uh, like uh, our very heart gratitude towards uh, Sarabhai, scientist Sarabhai, Sarabhai, jinke karan ki hamare desh ka pure vishwa mein ek naam hai aur hum Indian space program mein, jaisa ki aapne kaha, aaj ka jo mission hai, Prime Minister ka bhi, he self-dependent, uski shuruat to Sarabhai nahi ki thi. और उनका हमने आज सैनिटरी ईयर सेलिब्रेट किया ये हम इंस्टीट्यूट के लिए भी प्राउड है डायरेक्टर सर का ये जो विजन था कि आज के दिन ये लेक्चर हो और इन दो चैप्टर ने जो इसमें पूरी भूमिका निभाई और देहरादून से सर आपने जिस तरह का रियली रेलेवेंट डिटेलिंग यहाँ सबको दी उन सबके लिए हम तहे दिल से शुक्रिया अदा करते हैं सभी पार्टिसिपेंट्स का और सभी जो सीन और अनसीन मेंबर्स इन्होंने इसको पूरा सक्सेसफुली ऑर्गेनाइज करने में मदद की उनका सभी से तहत से थैंक यू ओवर टू यू विवेक सर सोन से थैंक यू टू ऑल सभी को धन्यवाद सो दिस इज अ एंड ऑफ अ वेरी गुड इवेंट एंड वंस अगेन आई थैंक ऑल पर्टिकुलरली आवर स्पीकर डॉक्टर चौहान सर थैंक्स वेरी मच सर थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच नमस्कार थैंक यू वेरी मच बाई थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू जी सर हाँ उसका रजिस्ट्रेशन चलो आपको भी थैंक यू और विवेक को भी थैंक यू विवेक तिवारी नया आदमी है इसमें ग्रुप में आ गया आप चलो ऑल द बेस्ट बताना फिर आगे हाँ या श्योर थैंक यू